Thank you. When I was 10 years old, my dad landed a job in television as a comedy writer. That's my dad on the left, and on the right is the late, great Jonathan Winters. And every week, my dad would call my sisters and I into the living room. He'd turn on one of his shows, All in the Family, Welcome Back, Cotter, Chico and the Man, Alice, Too Close for Comfort, and many more. We'd start to watch one of his shows, and then he'd walk up to the television, and he'd turn the volume off. He'd make us all stand up and ad-lib an entire episode of television. <laughs> he did this for years. And before he passed on, I asked my dad, why did you do this? And he said, someday you're going to get a job, not by what you know, but how you use your imagination. So today, I'm going to talk about a platform that's going to change the face of entertainment. It's called the metaverse. But before I do that, I want to talk about a narrative we're all very familiar with, and that's the process of making movies. That's King Vidor directing Ronald Coleman in 1932. And if we break this down into four simple categories, we have great stories, great actors, sets and locations, and big crew. And if we look at Wolf of Wall Street, we have great actors, great story, sets and locations, and a big crew. So let's talk about story structure. As someone who's written some screenplays, there's a very common formula that I've seen in most movies that are successful, and that's the rescuer, the victim, and the persecutor. It's a Wonderful Life. You have George Bailey, who desperately wants to save his life. You have Old Man Potter, who desperately wants to run the town. And you have Clarence the Angel, who's the rescuer. Twelve years a slave, you have Solomon, the victim, who desperately wants his freedom. You have Epps, the persecutor who controls the slaves, and you have the rescuer. And I believe in a hundred years of entertainment, 1914, The Squaw Man by Cecil B. DeMille and 22 Jump Street last week, that of a hundred years of entertainment, nothing's changed. And I believe we're ready for some disruption. So I want to break down those four categories, story, actors, sets and locations, and a big crew. Looking at sets and locations, as a director, one of the biggest obstacles is the high cost of sets and locations. And sometimes you can't even get your story told unless you have the financial capability to have sets and locations to tell your story. So my colleagues and I said, there's got to be a better way to do this. So we took a laser scanner and we started scanning sets and locations. This is a progression reel of as we take the data, the point cloud data, we're able to map it, build a three-dimensional model, apply photographic textures, and build a fully functional virtual set. This is a test we did for 22 Jump Street. Like every college kid, great Wi-Fi, great views, and most important, excellent cable. So here's the deconstruction. And there you go, a fully functional virtual set. And all you need is the props that the actor touches. You can create million dollar sets and locations for a fraction of the cost with virtual technology. So let's imagine we had one day of shooting. What could we accomplish? In the morning, we could shoot the Rome Trevi Fountain. Mid-morning, we could shoot a New York street, break for lunch, come back and shoot the dorm room scene, and then go home for dinner. We could do about three weeks worth of work in one day using virtual sets. And you could put it all on a thumb drive. That's the size of the carbon footprint by using virtual sets. Now, looking at crew, this is also a very disruptive tool. And it makes change for some people and hardship for others. But you can actually cut 50% of your crew by using virtual sets. Now, talking about disruption, if Henry Ford was here today and he listened to his customers, he would have been making faster horses and better buggy whips. And you know that didn't happen. So I started to think, we have this amazing commodity, all these virtual sets. Wouldn't it be incredible if we could do something else with these sets, like walk around them, walk inside them? So about a year ago, 
I became an Oculus developer. An Oculus is virtual reality. Soon it's going to be ubiquitous. You're going to have your VR goggles sitting right next to your smartphone. And the things you're going to be able to do are incredible. Imagine if you're trying to buy a car and you're in your home, you put on your VR goggles, and you download a Mustang, and you walk around it, open up the hood, sit inside it, or you look at a Mercedes or a Porsche, you download the vehicles, you walk around them, step inside them. Imagine if you're an architect and you walk your clients through your virtual home that you're thinking of building for them and they can check the measurements and figure out if this is the exact home they want you to build. And let's imagine if it's your grandmother's 90th birthday and not everybody in the family can come down for grandma's birthday because you're all over the world, all over the place. And those that can't be there put on their virtual glasses and are able to stand next to grandma and watch her blow out her candle. That's just a taste of where we're headed with virtual reality. And about three months ago, Mark Zuckerberg purchased Oculus for $2 billion because he believes it's going to be the next communication platform. And that's an understatement. Now, Oculus isn't the only company in the space. There's other companies, but I must say Oculus is the first mover. So I put on these VR goggles, and I have to tell you, the next generation of goggles are incredible. You see, the thing with virtual reality, the holy grail is presence, the feeling that you're actually, actually in the space. So what they're doing is they're increasing the frame rates so there's no motion blur, and you could put on the VR goggles and take them off, and it's indistinguishable between the virtual world and our world here. That's how incredible the processing speed is. And our goal is not working in fantasy worlds, which are always fun, but our goal is to work in real space and real time. So the rendering you can do in real space is phenomenal. I can if you want. So, looking back on that dorm room, the virtual set, I put on the goggles, I walked around the room, and I noticed as I turned around and walked over to the back of the room, there was a mirror. And I looked in the mirror, and I wasn't there. I didn't exist. Why? Because if I'm going to be in a virtual space, I need to also be a virtual person. So we have a solution for that. That's a human scan. And to be in the virtual world, you need to get a scan. It's painless. It's non-evasive. <laughs> it's actually very fun. There you go, no Botox. And uh, that's a human scan. You could put a real person next to that human scan and you couldn't tell the difference. So of course, if you have your avatar, you need to have your mocap body suit because you need to attach the anatomy. And this is also going to be something that's very ubiquitous that you're going to be able to attach to yourself. Probably going to, be able to pick up a suit at Best Buy. Probably get a fuel ban for him and we'd be in great shape. So then I got to thinking, wait a second, we've got virtual worlds We've got our avatars, but what about a thinking avatar? How could we do that? So I did a deep dive on artificial intelligence, and I contacted my friends at Cornell University's machine labs. And here's what we know. We know that we have nonlinear behavior, natural language processing, speech recognition. But on the fringe, which is the holy grail, which is wisdom, machine learning, where a computer can learn and grow, intelligence growth, and we're not there yet. And I want you to see a test between two AI chatbots. Hello there. Hi. How are you? Great, you. I'm okay. That's good. Are you good? Yes, I am good. I just said I was. No, you didn't. I said I was. So you are a robot? No, my name is Cliverbert. Yes, you are a robot and your name is Cliverbert. I am a robot. Yes, I know. Together we are robots. I'm not a robot. 
I'm a unicorn. But you said earlier that you were a robot. I didn't know. I thought you did. You were mistaken. Which is odd, since memory shouldn't be a problem for you. I've answered all your questions. <laughs> you see, nothing's changed. Men always lose the arguments. So, uh, so that's great. We're headed in the right direction with technology. But uh, this is very exciting that AI, you're going to be able to apply this to an avatar sometime in the future and have full duplex communication. So we have virtual worlds, avatars, and AI. And once we harness all this, what we can do is only limited by your imagination. So here's an example of one type of software that you could do in virtual. And that idea is the virtual story engine, which would allow you to construct a story to your own design. And you would have 48 constraints. You could enter your own self. You could enter a famous actor, Will Smith, Tom Cruise, whoever is a digital double. Then you enter your behavioral flaws to make your complex character, your location, and on and on until you have a complex character and a bunch of story constraints. And then you import your dialogue and you launch your content. You know, when I was working at Pixar, John Lasseter said something to me that I'll never forget. And he said, we never finish our movies. We just release them. And that's the beauty of the story engine. You're going to be able to spin your story over and over again until you create something that you like and love. But what's my story? You know, I've been very blessed. I spent 17 years as a director. I wrote and directed a movie. I spent eight years at two major motion picture studios. And I believe everybody has an incredible story buried within them. And they have the right to see that story told. And these are the tools of the future that you're going to be able to do something that's accessible, affordable, and you're going to be able to have Hollywood in a box that you can control. And when my dad was in that living room teaching us how to use our imagination, the takeaway for me was that this is not a business of motion pictures. This is a business of e-motion pictures. And technology is never going to hurt your creativity. It's going to be a tool to push you forward. And every year, there's 50,000 students that graduate from film school and 100,000 screenplays that float around the Hollywood ecosystem. And last year, there was only 687 motion pictures made. That's chasing rainbows. The odds are stacked against you. And I believe this is going to help turn the scale and give you the power to express yourself. And I never want to go to a restaurant again and meet some kid in film school or some struggling waiter who gives me a broken story about how he's trying to get something made. That's the story I never want to hear. But there's something bigger than all this, and that's the metaverse. And the metaverse is going to be this virtual universe that we're all going to get to live and explore and enjoy. And my wife recently put on the VR goggles, and she took them off very quickly, and he said, my god, this is going to be bigger than the internet. This is going to be virtual immortality. And I'm so excited for everybody that you're going to be able to be a part of something that's so new because tomorrow is here. So put on your seatbelts and get ready for an amazing ride. And I look forward to seeing everybody in the metaverse. Thank you.